Okay, I have a handout. Everybody make sure you get one. I'm going to talk just a little bit about this this morning. I guess before I do, though, a good way to start, because uh, I could jump right into this. I'll try to go kind of slow here to start. But how many of you remember when I talked about uh, the United Arab Emirates and the Jewish synagogue, the Christian supposed church, and the Islamic mosque that's in the process ready to open sometime in the fall of this year. Do you all remember that? I think it would yes, be on a Wednesday night. Listen to this. House of One. Berlin lays first stone for multi faith work worship center. Construction begins on the project that will unite Muslims, Jews, and Christians under one roof. So uh, start being ready for all of these things. Now, you can relate this maybe to something George Bush Sr. once said about how he Envision seeing a thousand points of light throughout the world. Remember, Satan, Lucifer, is the light bearer. The Bible talks about these things coming to pass in the end of days, and we're looking at them happening right now. This is why we need to get across to so many people. I, I know everybody, and, and I kind of hate to say some things this time, I actually believe some people aren't watching online anymore. Because I talked about all these folks that say they went up to heaven and they have all this revelation of everything and so on. And that's why I gave you this sheet that I handed you this morning. Uh, these are scriptural references that are descriptions of heaven and descriptions of hell. And so if somebody tells you what they went and how they got there and what they saw and it doesn't fit what the Bible tells you heaven and hell is, or if they tell you they saw Jesus and it doesn't fit the description biblically, biblically of who Jesus is, you need to pay attention. Amen. And you need to not follow that because these scriptures are the truth. The descriptions we read about in the scripture even when we go to John in the book of Revelation and look at what he said about what he saw, those are descriptions that are biblically fit for us to pay attention to. Amen? Amen. So quite a ways back, I talked about a group that taught their young people how to go to heaven. Not in the great catching way the Bible talks about in the end, but now go up to heaven, come back. And so a bunch of the children saw the same thing, but it doesn't fit what the Bible says. It doesn't talk about walkways and bushes made of bushes uh, along walkways that are made of stones and then lamps all over the place and street lights and things. It doesn't talk about any of that. And we need to pay attention to this because you become offensive if you go back and say, well, wait, here's what the scripture says. Because this spirit of the age, the spirit of Gnosticism, the spirit of Antichrist has infiltrated in areas these, this book is being taught to where people don't look at the book anymore. They look at what somebody said. Don't follow my words, follow the scripture. If I describe something and it gets off of that, know the scripture. Be a good Berean, like Paul said about those who went and referenced what he said to make sure that it was written. Because when Jesus talked about everything being fulfilled, he said it was about everything that was written in him in the scripture. Not what you and I would think they should do for him. Amen? Because the Bible tells us there's going to be a time they're going to say, Lo, Jesus is over there. No, Jesus is in the wilderness. No, Jesus is up in the water tower like Mary was up there one day. And so on. Uh, the statue of Jesus wept and it moved. That's really him. Listen, people who are now bowing down to idols, 
and worshiping in front of icons and pictures and all these other things? Do you think it'll be any different from them when the image speaks and they're commanded to bow down and worship the image? Something we talked about with Esther where Mordecai would not bow down to a man. Something where those young men said, we will not bow down when the sound of the flute is sounded. We will not do that. Everybody needs to pay attention. And I don't know, is it a minor thing when you say everybody changed how they dressed and changed the background in the churches because somebody said, you can't do it that way anymore. Pressure from society. Conform to what we say or you won't get us in your doors. A lot of people said that to Noah that we talked about last week. What happened? They didn't go in the door. What happened with Noah? In the end, he came out praising God because of all the destruction. We're going to talk a little bit about that today again some more. Just in an uplifting area because you want to be uplifted, right? Listen, if you are downtrodden and depressed in the Lord all the days of your life, don't worry, in the end, you're going to be lifted up. Amen. Amen? And that's what we live for, though we may struggle through some things and war with some things and people be offended at our very presence because of what we stand for. You guys are all still standing up. That's nice. <laughs> hey, go ahead. You can sit down. I think I've already started. So some folks won't watch or listen because of the way you dress. But they will point the finger and say, don't judge me. But you've already judged how I'm dressed. You can't get anything good out of a guy that has a sport coat and a tie on. Think about that. Or a guy that doesn't have the proper background. Did I just go off? Yep. The proper background. Isn't that amazing? People who came and said, I won't come to church here because you still have pews. Wow. <laughs> One day you may be thankful to sit down on anything. Amen. Anywhere. Right? That's okay. I'm not worried about the sound. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. I'll be a little, maybe a little grovelly, but if you can hear me, that's good. I'm not worried about this thing whatsoever. I say it always sounds better when it goes out to anybody else without that anyhow, if I'm allowed to say how, anyhow. <laughs> okay, so this morning, Luke chapter 30, or excuse me, chapter 17, verse 35 and 36, and I'm already looking at all this stuff I put together and thinking, you know, I'm going to have to really go fast, but I'm going to try not to go fast. It says, two women shall be grinding together some of you are sitting together today so just think of that the one shall be taken and the other left and two men shall be in the field the one shall be taken and the other left and you and I listen in the days we're in as well as any other days since the time of creation. We need to work on and decide, do we want to be left or do we want to be taken? Isn't that the goal in all this? Amen. All of what the Lord did for us. That we have a decision to make. You have, we could say, because everybody wants to know you're wonderful, you're great, I'm full of self-esteem, I, you know, I'm beautiful, I'm exotic, I'm whatever everybody needs me, everybody wants that, although the Bible tells us unless we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, we don't get to enter in. But since you want all that, listen, you get to choose whether you get left or not. That's a great choice. Amen. God gave that to everybody. People out there that don't understand it, they still have the choice. They can get left or they cannot get left. What does getting left mean? Getting left means when Christ comes to purge this earth, 
just like it was in the days of Noah when Noah went into the ark. We just talked about last week. When he came out, everything was destroyed. We're going to read that part about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Same thing, when it describes what was done and Lot had gone into the city, we're going to talk about when these things happen. Because there's so much confusion. I was blessed to have a fellow that we had here quite a ways back, right before the, the pandemic was actually made known. And uh, he taught on world events and globalism and some things. And uh, he happened to call me last week and tell me he was going to be here and ask me to meet him, which I did. And we had great conversation and so on. And uh, he shared at a group meeting and asked me to come there. So one of the questions uh, when he talked about all these things that are coming and what they're setting up and the different things, somebody wanted to know, well, what's going to happen to my 401k? I'd be more concerned about my wife, my children, uh, everything else. I mean, I understand. You may not remember what that term means by the time these things come about. But anyway, somebody else said, well, won't we be raptured out before all these things? And I told him at lunch, I was very glad you answered the way you did because he said, that would be a nice thought. And then he didn't say anything else. He just left it at that. I hope I've gotten across maybe more because I've tried to be a little more intent in this, that if we have the idea that somewhere along the line here, God owes us to take us out sooner than he did with anybody else because we're Americans, because we are prosperous, or because, you know, well, we've got the cycle all figured out. Um, listen, none of the cycles in life have gone on forever, except what God created, the heaven, the earth, the seasons, he said, will go on until the very end. Financial markets have collapsed. 250 years is the basic cycle of a financial market or an empire. And if you watch the kingdoms of the world, you'll find that there's almost a scale you can perfectly follow that by years, all of a sudden, the empire coming down is crossing with an empire coming up. And so that new empire, suddenly, their monetary system becomes globalized just like the American dollar has been used for all over the world globally. And so you may say, well, what does that have to do with us? It means you need to really start seeking the Lord because things may change because we're at about 220 to 25 years right now, if not 230. So that means as Americans, our empire may be not too much longer. You wanted to hear that this morning, right? You don't have anything to fear. Another one's coming up on the, on the horizon. You just got to know what to do and how to prepare. And in all this, it may be that the Lord is making it known. So we do know what to do. So we are ahead of some of these things as much as we can be. And you all know sometimes, you know, you can prepare for a tornado. You can board up your windows. Uh, you know, you can take off and evacuate and go somewhere else, and you come back, your house is gone. At least you tried to board up your windows. You can't prevent the fact that it hit your house more than it should have or you'd have liked it to, but you prepared for it. Amen. And you got out of the way of it, right? Mm -hmm. So two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. That's our choice. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. What happens to the ones that are taken? The Bible refers to in various places here, we'll go through some of them uh, sort of in a little different area, but talks about the great catching away, that Christ is going to return. He's going to be in the clouds. He's going to call up his people. There's going to be the shout, what we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the last trump and I'll say very clearly again 
It's not talking about one of Donald Trump's kids being in office. And that means this is where this all goes because I've listened to religious people say that kind of stuff. So, I'd say it's good reason to get your house in order. It's good reason to realize, and I don't mean your physical house that you live in, I mean the physical house of this temple, Amen. the house of God, the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, as the Bible says, that we're to get it in order. How do we do that? We start realizing we got to stop some of this stuff and start spending more time in the Lord, be more intent about the things of God. As we were praying yesterday, one of our sisters was praying about that very thing, and that's that's good. That's what we need to keep praying. And remember, the Bible tells us, when you think that you stand, take heed, lest you fall. You may say, I'm a mighty prayer warrior now. I'm strong. I'm all this stuff. He said, you better take heed, lest you fall. Don't ever count on where you were to get you through what's coming in the future. You might be able to run a mile today and tomorrow some guy starts chasing you and uh, let's say you've been smoking now for the last year and uh, suddenly your lungs can't take it anymore. You get a quarter of the mile down the road, the guy catches you. It ain't like it used to be. You've let things creep in that have sort of hindered your running ability, your breathing ability, all these things. Get your house in order. Uh, the, the temple, which is your body, as the Bible says, um, I got so many sheets here that I've moved stuff around, but it says in John chapter 2, verse 21, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the various things, and I believe this was where he said about, uh, if you take down this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. It says, but he spoke of the temple of his body. Your body, our bodies are the temple of the Lord. We're the place where the Holy Spirit now dwells within us. And so you need to be mindful of that all the time. He spake of the temple of his body. So what are you allowing in your body? Remember, one of these days, one is going to be left and one is going to be taken. You may be working with somebody and walking with somebody and think, you know, they're right in the same mindset that you are. Because the Bible says, how can two walk together except they agree? It talks about that three-stranded cord. And you think, well, they're just like me. But all of a sudden, you may be taken and they're left. Because they aren't sincere, they aren't honest, they aren't really walking in the Lord. Uh, there's a little Christian movie I watched where uh, this young man had gotten himself into a debate, and so the time came to go and debate, but the people he was going to debate with, he was going to debate the gospel with, and he was going to be the Christian debater, the other side found out that he wasn't living the life. He'd been messing with some little girl that was like, a, not a prostitute, but something like that, and he got a DUI, and so they just sort of told him, hey, we know about these things, and all of a sudden, the night of the debate, he goes to his Christian friends and says, you guys, I haven't been living the life. There's some things I did that you don't know about. Now, in all of that, there's a lot of people living a lot of stuff, involved in a lot of things. You think, and I think they're just like us, and other people look at us and think we're just like them. But if we're hiding stuff, you know, if you got, uh, you know, uh, stuff you're putting in your temple and storing it there that you know shouldn't be there, we're coming to this kind of a place, everybody. Amen. I read you that little bit, just about another one of these Places where the unification, what we called Chrislam for a while, where the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims are going to worship together. They're going to put these places 
excuse me, I got a cough drop in my mouth and it's making me sort of catch a little bit. They're going to put these places all over. And don't think that you're going to be allowed to just go and do what you please because one day they may come and say, you have to go to these places. They may do everything they can to abolish everything else. Just like how many of you are mindful, uh, we're talking about a new world coming, right? You've heard me say this over the last six months or so about, you know, the song, A Whole New World and the various things and uh, John Lennon again, I keep bringing that up because I just, I don't think people get what these words are doing. We all understand when the Lord comes, he's going to purge the earth, right? What's he going to purge it with? Fire. Fire. I'm going to read you in the description of what happened with Lot. Now, we talked about Noah. When Noah got off the ark, the Bible tells us that every living creature died, right? Every living creature that walked the earth, every human that walked the earth. Now, I don't know if it means the fish, because the fish are in water anyway, but they died. So I mentioned, well, nobody really says this, but when Noah got off the ark, what did he see? And would that cause you, if you got off the ark and saw all the millions of people dead and the animals all dead and the trees and everything smashed down and any buildings that they lived in, houses or anything else, demolished, would it cause you to get down on your knees and worship like he did? When you read the description of Lot, it says that when Lot left Sodom, he went to Zor, and the Bible says that the angels had warned him that judgment was going to come. And you remember the story of Lot's wife. She looked back because she had an affinity with what was back there. We need to cut that. That, that Bible tells us we're not to love this world. You might enjoy going to an event, but if that event supersedes your time of praise and worship with God, you got to ask yourself, is there a love there that is wrong? And so many of us need to go through these things in our lives, no matter who it involves or what it involves. If this supersedes my love for the Lord, my obedience to the Lord, my willingness to do what he says, I probably need to cut, what, how'd that old thing go? Cut it out. Get it out of your life. Because if it'll do that to you now, when there's more pressure applied, when there's world pressures applied, when they're saying that you shouldn't do that anymore, you shouldn't be like that anymore, society starts saying to you, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's going to be harder to cut out Amen. in every area. Do you really believe Jesus is coming back? Yes, sir. I do too. And it's starting to scare me in the sense of watching people that say, oh yeah, I'm all ready with Jesus. I don't see nothing in there that says you're ready with Jesus. I doubt that you even pray anymore. You've renounced some of the things you were taught to do in the early days because somehow now you're just sort of moseying along and drifting along. People used to say we, we thought we were the only church. Never thought that. But the thing is, if you're not being taught the principles of the gospel and why you need to get ready and why you need to stand and what you need to abstain from and how you need to fear God, you might want to say, hey, at least listen in every once in a while. If you're offended because I told you you're not allowed to go to heaven every time you want to and hell to check it out and see and come back and whatever. If that offends you, my gosh, where's your head at? Yeah. Amen. So let's talk about the rapture, the great catching away of the church. Our friend that was here with me said a big ministry kind of cut him off. 
because he said, you know, I don't necessarily agree that we're going to get raptured out before the tribulation. He said, no more conversation. No more can we talk about it. You're not allowed to say that. <laughs> well, I don't see in the scripture where it says if you think that, you can't go to heaven. Listen, if the Bible, if Jesus comes before I thought he was going to come, he says he's still going to catch us up, right? Amen. Do you remember when I told you all about a church I went up to in the Cleveland area? Uh, Marv Rosenthal had been there, Zion's Fire, down in Florida. And I went in and I thought, gosh, this place is going to be packed. Sanctuary as big as ours, maybe even a little bigger. Maybe if you had our balcony out the back there. Uh, and I went, there were like 30 people, and they had to be, let's see, this was 15 years ago, I was uh, 50, so 52, something like that. These people had to be in their 70s, and there was like 18 to 25 of them. And I said, my goodness, I, I just thought there'd be a lot more people here to hear him. And the lady said to me, well, sir, he was here once before, and told the church that we might not get raptured out before the tribulation period. And the pastor said, after studying the word, I'm starting to believe that too. 80% of the church left. You don't remember me talking about this maybe? And here's what I said to you then. So now that they're in a church that says that it's gonna come at a different time, is it gonna come at a different time? No, it's still going to come when the Lord prepares it to come. Amen. When he says, son, go and get my church. It ain't going to matter what church you decided to follow in that. Do you think the Ukrainian people believed war was going to come like this? No. Do you think people really want to believe that this could be World War III? No, they don't want to believe that. It'll affect how they live. It'll affect our finances. What will we do with our 401k? <laughs> because that's where people are at. Well, wait a minute, I scheduled a vacation that week. Well, sir, do you realize a major war just happened? Does that mean I can't keep my reservation? Yeah. <laughs> But isn't that how we think? One shall be taken, the other left. One shall be taken, the other left. Has this affected us enough to say, you know what? Whatever I have to do, I'm going to do to not be left. Amen. Whatever I have to cut out. Whatever I have to give up, whatever I have to let go. Oh, and it's easy to say, well, I won't go shopping anymore. How about the things that are living in our heart where I just rebel against everything and they're either going to bow down to me or that's just the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. You all know people like that. And they're living as believers. But let me go back to, wait a minute, they cut you off because you disagreed about when this will happen? You didn't say it won't happen. You just said, I don't know about the timeline. Um, did Jesus ever talk, I think you and I, we talked about this just last week, except our righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees? Amen. I'd say that's pretty pharisaical so you're telling me because you and I don't see eye to eye on something you cut I've had people badmouth me louse me up and mock me and I still go back and talk to them I still love them and want to see them get right with God Amen. and I've had brothers and sisters that have done it well you all know what went on right a while back so you get everybody together you rise up you say some things and all of a sudden nobody's talking to me 
What's wrong? What is that? How does that happen in us who say, I am so forgiving and so loving. Why, I'm just a perfect example of Jesus. And yet I've run into the same people that all that was all about and so on and say, hey, hi, how are you? Because that doesn't dwell in here. Amen. Thank God. And I pray that it never does. And I pray that I'm not a hypocrite. I pray that I'm not a Pharisee. I pray that I'm not a two-faced liar and deceiver. Amen. Because there's so much of this in the churches. Everybody says, well, the church is hypocritical. Well, yeah, there's hypocrites in the church. We'd love to straighten you out <laughs> if you'd let us. This word straightens. Right? That's why Jesus said, the scripture says, make straight paths for your feet. He says the valleys are going to be exalted and the mountains brought low. That means we've got flat plain to work on. That's what he wants to do in our lives. But we've got to be willing. We've got to be willing to be mocked, willing to be ridiculed. Willing that, Lord, you know what? I've made a total mess out of this. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I don't know what I'm doing in everything. And how about when you are the big rebel, and yet you don't want to acknowledge it says that's witchcraft. Yeah. You stand before the Lord, whichever you stand before, the Lord Jesus or the Lord God, and he says, well, you heard over and over and over again, you were a witch. You didn't want to acknowledge it. I don't know when we say we're born again and we're a witch at the same time, whether we make it into the kingdom or not. That should be scary. Amen. One left and the other taken. Well, I was right next to you in all the prayer meetings. But I said, you'll never get me to do that. Why, I'll never... And don't you ever, and all those kind of things. Hey, and we wonder why people don't really want to go to church the way church is. We got to have the bands. We got to have the background. We got to de redecorate everything. I got to dress down. I got to take my shirt and tie and stuff and come in my undershirt and show a tattoo I got back when I was 16 years old before I knew the Lord. So you'll follow me. So you'll listen. I don't think Jesus stressed down. No. In fact, why I'm going to this is I've been reading Luke chapter 17 through 20. You remember there was the man who had the talents? There's a term he was called. Anybody remember what it was? He was a nobleman, not just a man. That's in Luke chapter 17, I think, about the talents. And then when you get in Luke 20, it talks about the man who had a vineyard and the term, he was a nobleman. That means he wasn't a low-class citizen. He wasn't a nobody. It means this guy lived an above the average life, a noble man. It's referring to our master. So in one, it says that he went away to receive a kingdom, which makes me wonder about all these folks that say they're building a kingdom here on earth. He didn't tell us to build a kingdom. He said to pray, thy kingdom come. Amen. Because when he comes, because he went away to receive a kingdom, when he comes, he's going to bring the kingdom with him. And set up the kingdom on earth. I know I'm way out of where we were going, but he's going to purge this earth down to the very foundation. Because when you tear down a building, you either build on that foundation or you dig out the foundation too and put in a new foundation. But he laid the foundation already, right? The Bible says. So everything else is going to be purged. When Lot went out of Sodom. The Bible says that God sent fire from heaven, right? Fire and brimstone. Amen. And everything was destroyed. It says 
all the buildings, the people, the trees, the ground was destroyed. In other words, he took it down to nothing so that nothing from that mindset, heart, where we get the term sodomy, would be alive anymore. But, of course, we know sodomy is still alive, right? That's all this pedophilia and all the other stuff. Now, God purged this place because of sodomy. And yet, our system now says sodomy is so acceptable and you need to just love them and acknowledge them. And if you watch the TED Talks, you'll see them saying how they need to be accepted just like the rest of us. They just have different thoughts. Yeah, they have thoughts that God sent fire from heaven because of. And they can be forgiven, no doubt about that. That's not the unpardonable sin. God loved the person, except if they continue in that, it says he's angry with the, uh, e with the ungodly every day with the evil. So God's anger has been there ever since these people started doing what they're doing. And in somebody's life, since the day they entered into these things, God's been angry with them. Amen. That's what the scripture says. Now, the last time I used that scripture back a couple years ago, somebody came to me afterwards and was upset that I would read or say something like that. And you've been in this church 30 years? And you're offended at the scripture? Are you serious? That's like one of the most immature positions a person can take. Amen. Hey, listen, I don't think I even understand the fear of God, if you think you do. Or the reverence of God, or what God's judgments really are. I know what we can read in the scripture, which is enough, the Bible says, so that we will believe. But... I don't think we understand it all in its fullness and what he's really saying to us. Amen. I don't need a description of another heaven. I don't need a description of another hell. I don't need an image of another God. That ain't going to get me to heaven. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be bowing down to images and ideas and imaginations that are going to be destructive in the end. And so we need some people to stand up and speak clarity. And if that means giving them a beating, well, what does the Bible say? When he sent his servants, when we read about in these scriptures here, the one with the talents is one thing. But when he created the vineyard and he went away into a far country, it says that he sent somebody else and they beat him. And then somebody else and they beat him. And you can transpose that back over to where it describes him sending his son and he thought well they will reverence him but they beat him and then tried to take the kingdom listen right now you believe the kingdom of god is coming Amen. the world that he talks about a new jerusalem a new world Amen. see the antichrist and the spirit of antichrist and satan through all of that is trying to build a new world right now. You're watching it. It has a terminology its vessels will use. They'll say new world order. They always had the word order because they're telling you this is what our father wants. Didn't Jesus say to those Pharisees, you're of your father, the devil? That means they're born of the devil as you and I are born of God, except a man be born again. So everybody's being born again, only some to evil and us to God. Amen. Think about that. The world is setting up its kingdom right now. Maybe its main place will be there in Abu Dhabi where they put the mosque the synagogue and the vatican's all behind all of that the papacy maybe it'll be the papacy itself uh, we talk about 
uh, renewed Roman Empire, but I want you to remember that there was the Rome of the East and the Rome of the West. The Rome of the West is Rome itself, the city. The Rome and the Vatican and the papacy of the East was over there in Babylon, in Iraq, in the Eastern countries. And so the one in the West fell, but the one in the East is the one you're hearing about all the time now. When we're looking at what's happening right now, we're going to purge the earth. Listen, the enemy, Lucifer, wants to purge the earth of Christianity and of God. Not, I shouldn't even say Christianity. Bible-believing followers of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Yes. He wants to purge the earth of all of that. He wants to purge the earth of the church. And one day he's going to get his way because Jesus is going to take us out. And the earth is going to be his for a little bit of a season. I guess I want to go to, let's, let, let's look at this. Well, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 12 through 29, if you go read that, I'm not going to read it all, but I'll just jump to part of this. Are you with me so far, or have I kind of lost you? I guess stay right there for a second, because since I'm talking about this new world order, the spirit of Antichrist, which, remember, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us that the God of this world, right? So we have a God we serve, who is the God who created the world who this God is now taking over a little bit or controlling for a season and a time. He's the God of this world, but our God is the God that created him and created the world. Right? But for now, I wrote this down, we're going to see his world order lifted up. And already people are saying, this is going to be wonderful. This is going to be beautiful. Why, there won't be any more wars when all this is settled and so on. That's why I told you, listen, don't look at Ukraine and the leader of Ukraine as some kind of a hero or a god because there's so much behind the scenes you don't know about. Amen. You don't understand what they're doing there and how they're using all this. So he's setting up his world order right now. He's cleaning things up, and cleaning up means... Listen, uh, we, we drive by, you all familiar there on the corner of North Road, they're putting a new speedway in. There were some office buildings, there was a nice little gateway building and so on there on the corner. I remember back in the day when that was a gas station and it changed over to a rental place and so on. Uh, I was telling my wife, because she didn't know this, but that was where one of our neighbors who was in the mob and ran the area, him and some guys got caught at the phone booth out front. They had quarters on a wire. And they were making long distance calls. These guys got tons of money. They're dropping a quarter in the phone, uh, phone, the telephone, pay phone, and pulling it back out. So you get the click and you get the register, you get the money registers and you pull it back out and you do it again. Like, what in the world would you do something so stupid for? So the feds are across the street watching it. And of course they got them. I don't know, I think it's long enough ago I can talk about that. That's like four or five blocks from my house. The guy lived on my block and so on. Anyway, if you just wanted to hear a mob story real quick. But that was what my father always warned us about when we were younger. Don't ever let them do anything for you because you'll pay for it later. Amen. No game. So he's setting up his order. So they're at the speed where they're going to put the speedway in. First thing they did is they came through and tore everything down. Right? That's normal. You're used to that. But not only did they tear everything down, they dug up everything out of the ground all the foundations to the other buildings and block and concrete pads and everything else. 
And so then they laid the foundation for the new building. And you're watching all that right now. Maybe you see it, maybe you don't. When you want a new world order, you got to come in and destroy the old world order. You got to make it look so bad. That's why a lot of people, when, especially government agencies, when they want new stuff, they tell the supervisor, well, listen, this truck, it's got bad brakes and the brake lines are going bad and the transmission shifting bad and all this other stuff. We, want, we need new trucks. So because they got abundance of money, they'll just go buy a new truck. Nobody ever goes back and rechecks. So you tell them the buildings are all terrible. This system is terrible. And nobody really knows history anymore. Well, gosh, they said it's terrible. It must be terrible. We must be the worst country in the world. And all this thing of us, the millions and millions and billions of dollars were given away even as of last year. Well, that can't be true. Well, yeah, it's true. Amen. Because we want to tear all this down. We're going to tell you a whole different story. We're going to tell you there's holes in the roof. The foundation is broken. It's tilting. Why, underneath there, there's uh, molten lava getting ready to come up through the toilet if you sit down. <laughs> because we want to get rid of this thing. And they're doing it right in front of your eyes. You have to tear all this down to build this new world order. But this new world order is only going to be there for a little while because Christ is going to come up and set up his kingdom. Amen. And that's what we're waiting for. How do you get ready for that? You better start getting stuff out of this temple room. You know, we... Here in the building, we had some stuff we don't need anymore, so we've been pulling it out. Somebody says, well, why we got all that stuff over there? Well, we took one building, two buildings, that stuff, everything else, got it all out, and everything's out there because we don't want it. We don't need it. It's in our way, whatever the case. Things that we're talking about, you and I know are sins in our life. Get them out of there because Christ is coming. So now, let's go to, because uh, <clears throat> remember, he blinded their minds. They don't think like we think. How many of you think about the good old days? Put your hand up if you think about the good old days. You're not allowed to think that anymore. you got to think about how good this new world order thing's going to be. It's going to be beautiful. And listen, everybody's looking for an identity. Young people are looking for identities. But it's all fake. It's all paper. Just like your money is paper. It's fake. If you look at my Facebook page and I'm always dressing my picture up and telling you wonderful things, why I can show you pictures of Italy and places I've never been. Just put it on my Facebook page using paper and pictures and things and you think I'm all over the world. No, I'm still in my bedroom, sorry. In fact, I haven't even gotten dressed yet. But everybody goes for it. I talked about, when we showed the video, this has been a year and a half ago, about social scoring in China. And I might have told you then, but maybe a little bit afterward, Open Doors Ministry came out and said what they're doing in China, they're going to do all over the world. You're going to be a social score. You're going to be a picture on the Internet with facts and figures and no personality and no character whatsoever. Because that's what the world does to people. That's what Satan does to people. And you'll say, I need to be fulfilled. No, you'll be whatever they tell you to do. Just like these folks that, you know, you're hearing about these stories of the Russians. They went to war. Everybody thought these Russians are going to come up and kill us all. And here they're going like, hey, we don't even know why we're here. They told us this was an exercise. I thought we were just coming to protect the border. They had no idea. That's how people will be. We didn't know they were planning to annihilate a lot of people. We didn't know they were planning to go against our parents and our families and everybody else. We thought we were just helping this new society come about. We need to pray that way. 
How many of you remember when Noah went into the ark? The scripture literally says, let me see, it literally says here uh, in Genesis 7, 7, or I'm sorry, yeah, 7, 7. Genesis 7, 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the flood. That term because of means the waters were already starting. Amen. You hear me? Amen. If you go down Or back to, excuse me, write this down, Luke chapter 17, verse 29. It says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. Anybody have an idea what same day means in the Greek or in the Hebrew? I'm sorry. Anybody know? Uh, it'll, it, it says, but the same day Lot went out of Sodom, Luke chapter 17, verse 29, it rained fire and brimstone. Okay. It literally means the same day. The same day Lot went out means the same day. Literally within a 24-hour period, the same day. It rained down fire and brimstone. Noah went into the ark because of the waters. Luke chapter 17, verse 27. You know, it goes, it says, as it was in the days of Noah in 16 and so on, so shall it be uh, in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. In other words, life was going on just like we're seeing it going on today. They were given in marriage until until the day, the literal 24-hour period that Noah went into the ark. Are you seeing anything here? The ark didn't take off one day, months ahead of time, and pick up the righteous. The angels didn't go into Sodom months or years ahead of time and take out the righteous. You hear me? Yes. You get what I'm saying here? Yes. You see what I'm saying. I don't even have to say it. What does it say? The same day. The same day Lot, the same day Noah, the same day. I said this to somebody, this goes back at least 15 years ago. Listen, when you read about the great catching away, it doesn't say that Jesus is coming somewhere in the middle of there. Corinthians tells us at the sound of the trump, and I used to say to you all, listen, you better go back and the last trump. Find out what is going on at the last trump because that's when it signifies that we're coming. And if you read that scripture in Revelation, you'll find that just after that, it's the wrath of God. And I want to make sure you all understand what we're talking about. That you're not hoping in, like, you know, if, if war breaks out here or like this virus thing, remember after two and a half weeks, because we were told it would only be two weeks, after two and a half weeks, you were saying this is over. And now we're hearing about it coming around again out of the northeast here, the north co uh, east coast, the northeast uh, states, that it's bombarding things again. You see the President's White House uh, 
Press secretary got it again. Former president got it again. We thought that was over, over and done with, because that's what we want to believe. I can remember we had guest speakers here years and years ago, and the one fellow we watched a video of where, hallelujah, and we're going to be out of here. We don't know that. We don't know that. You said God heals, and so demand, and God, you better heal me. That's it. Only you've been struggling with it for years. Should tell us something. Yes, it may be because of faith and so on and so forth, and it may be like Paul. You know, he sought the Lord three times, yet that thing was still with him. But yet we still got to love the Lord, serve God, go on, clean this temple, know that the judge standeth at the door, as the Bible says. We need to be ready. You say, I'm tied up in this, I'm tied up in that, I got this problem, I got that problem. Let me tell you something, ain't been one person come to me for counseling. Some people say, well, I already know what he's going to say. Well, then do what you know I'm already going to say. Get out of it. I don't mean to yell. We're not on, right? I, I, oh, I am on. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I thought that was never on. Okay, anyway. And I'm saying to myself, I need to stop things. I need to do more of this. I'm older now, I know. I'm still looking at, hey, if we can go to Israel and share the gospel, if I can go, I'm going. Amen. If we get invited to some of these places, you guys, listen. What else are you doing? Think about it. What are we doing for the Lord? Amen. For years, we didn't do missions or any of that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that's the answer to everything. We had folks here to take care of and tend to, but we put most of that on the guy in charge. So this thing says that in that same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. I jumped back, I'm sorry, to Luke uh, 17, 29. And destroyed them all. And it says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, why would he say it's going to be like that in the day, the, son, the, day, the literal day, that the Son of Man is revealed? Why would he tell us that? There's our preparation. I wonder when the Lord's coming. Well, there's what we can see. We don't know the exact day and hour, but he's told us everything to do to be ready. I've torn my notes to shred here. I'm nowhere near where we should have been. Hey, Matthew 3.13, it says he's going to purge his floor. Just like I watched those excavators and different things, they went in and tore all that building down, pushed all that stuff out of the way, piled it up, get this junk out of here. He's going to purge his floor. Gather his wheat into the garner. Gather the wheat. That's us. Like I said last week, he gathers his lambs in his arms. He said to Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you, but you would not. I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. Well, now we don't want to get too into this Jesus thing and Bible stuff and go on to be with the Lord. I mean, it might affect how we live. We don't want to get too into that. Somebody might not like us. Better be liked of God. Amen. Better be known of God. I was, uh, I think we pulled it up, the song, He Knows My Name, or I, He Knows, You Know My Name, whatever it is. Listen, He better know your name. That's all of us. Amen. Now, I told you, I'm saying, Lord, I, like, uh, did I quote Nehemiah once last week where Nehemiah said, listen, I'll just give you these real quick if you want to read them. In Nehemiah 13, verse 14, verse 22, and verse 31. Nehemiah 13, verse 14. Nehemiah 13, 22, and Nehemiah 13, 31. 
Remember me, O God, concerning this, and don't wipe out the good deeds I've done concerning the house of my God. Nehemiah 13, 22, I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves. Folks, are you the priests of God? Yes. Cleanse yourself. It's what we're talking about, your temple. I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates, sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O God, concerning this also, and spare me according to thy great mercy. If I'm reminding you all the time, cleanse yourself, you're the Levites, you're the priests now, and sanctify the gates. In other words, keep the Sabbath. We talked about that last week, and that's why I referred to Nehemiah. But in this, reminding all the time that this is what we're to do. Listen, I'm not real worried if somebody says, I don't want to listen to you because you don't agree with this and you don't agree with that. If I'm wrong scripturally, then I care. If you're telling me I have to say that you're allowed to travel to heaven and hell whenever you want to, I mean, Elon Musk and these guys are going to the planets. Well, we get to go to heaven. I don't think that's what God's talking about us being blessed in the Lord. Amen. Okay? If that causes you to disagree with me, I'm sorry. If you disagree with the timing of the rapture and so on, read scripture. Amen. Scripture tells us these things. Yes, it tells us that, you know, us who die in the Lord will be caught up and then you know, us who are alive and remain will be caught up where? In the air. Where is the Lord coming from? In the air. Did you ever think maybe what he's saying is, we hear that shout in Revelation, that last trump come up as it is with the voice of the angel. The Lord is there in the air. The, the clouds have already rolled back as a scroll like the Bible says. We go to meet him in the air. The dead go before us. We meet him in the air, and it's time we're with our Lord Amen. in what we're talking about. Think about it. We don't have to know all the other details. Just read what the scripture says. When he comes, he's coming. I better be ready whenever he calls. And if I go through some things, it's no different than my brethren. How many of us know people or... <clears throat> have heard about the people that died for their faith. We somehow think we aren't allowed to, that God would never, could never, should never because of who we are. Let that happen to us. Yet the Bible says that those are the ones that are there in the kingdom in heaven and they're the ones that are crying out for the justice. I commanded them they should cleanse themselves. Listen, preaching of the gospel is supposed to be commanding all of us to cleanse ourselves, Amen. to examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith, to reminding. He said so many times, I know that you know this, but I'm going to remind you again because you need to be stirred in these things. And I know a lot of the other stuff, things look like everybody goes and they come home and there's no charge put on them and whatever the case. You know, say what you will about all that. How many people said, well, you know, I didn't know there was a pandemic. I told you we were down there and I was in Nashville when all this stuff started and nobody talked about it whatsoever. Come back here, I walked to the mall the day after I got off the plane. Not a single person in the mall. What in the world's going on? I mean, I heard, but I didn't think anything happened. Nobody. I don't know if you remember, I took a picture and posted it on Facebook. I'm out here in the middle of the day walking at the mall. There's nobody here. The stores are shut down. A couple places open. Because something's going on. It's going to be like that in the end. There's going to be people that weren't preparing. They didn't get oil in their lamps. They didn't trim their wick. Why does it talk about all this stuff? They didn't multiply with their talents. Yesterday, I think it was, we were talking about something, and I said, 
What if the word of God that you've heard all of your life is the talent God gave you? And what have you done with it? What if that's what we're going to answer for? You heard all of this, and you didn't do much with any of it. And I know, and I've had people say this to me, that leave congregations, well, you shouldn't say things like that. You might make the people feel guilty. I don't want you to feel guilty. But if that's, there's a little similarity to guilt and condom or yeah. conviction, yeah. being convicted and feeling guilty. Yeah, I've done none of that. You're supposed to feel that. We're supposed to feel that. Yeah. Conviction. And then he said, uh, let's see. He talked about some of the things he had him do in Nehemiah 13, 31, and he talked about a wood offering, appointed times, and first fruits. And then he said, remember me, oh my God, for good. Have you ever run into somebody and all you think about while they're talking to you or when you see them as something they did that was nasty to somebody else or toward you or whatever, and you know, you're looking at them and Nehemiah said, I don't want you to remember me for any of that kind of stuff. That's why you and I have an advocate with the Father, because he loves us so much that we can be forgiven and cleansed immediately and have it out of our way. He says, remember me, oh my God, for good. Hey, yeah, I know your name. You did this, you did that. You tried to push this. You reminded the Levites of who they were. You commanded people to cleanse themselves. You did all these things so that my people would be stirred to go on. I mean you, I mean you, I mean you, all of us, wherever we are. Remember me for good. Don't remember me for uh, being a thorn in somebody's side or a thorn in the ministry or a reproach before the Gentiles like it was, he said to the Jews, the priesthood, you blaspheme my name in front of the Gentiles. I don't want to blaspheme your name. Amen? Amen. So I kind of went around about a wrong, well, not wrong way, but a different way than I was, but I hope you got that. So you remember Genesis chapter 8, verse 1? God remembered Noah, right? Amen. Very mindful of that? Somebody accused me one day of saying that I was like Noah because when I got asked and told to be in this position while I was locked away over there in that crazy business thing I was in, that I thought I was Noah, and so that was why I talked about that furthest thing from my imagination, never thought about it whatsoever, till they brought it up to me and said that. Yeah, I've been accused of a lot of things. That I was talking about myself if I ever referred to this. Well, hey, in the long run, think about it. If you've really tried to do good and so on, and God remembered you in a way like that, wow, what a blessing. Okay, if that is the case and God remembered all the things I did, which a lot of people never knew in the ministry and for the, the man of God and so on and some of the brunt of things that I dealt with and took on, and I'm not tooting my, own, my horn for that, but I did. And things I committed and things I blessed with and so on. And God doesn't forget, you guys. Whatever you've done, he doesn't forget. He remembered Noah that he, a hundred and, well, or 350 or 60 days ago before I let him be stuck in that ark, he was out there preaching righteousness. He obeyed me. He built. He told the people. He warned. He gathered who he could, which ended up being his family. At least they got in there. But he remembered. He remembers. When we stand before him, you're not going to have to jump up and say, Lord, I, but, I, but I, no, he remembers. He remembered Abraham, too. You remember that in the time of Lot? Amen. It says that he remembered Abraham in Genesis chapter 19. And I guess I didn't mark it down exactly which verse it is. It says it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain. Remember, he didn't just destroy Sodom. He destroyed the cities of the plain. 
that God remembered Abraham. How did he prove he remembered him? It says he sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. You need a reason to pray for your family? You want God to remember something? Abraham talked to God about what was going on. God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out. God, don't forget our prayers. Nope. Remember who my family members are, Lord. Remember those people I've been saying to you over and over and over again, Lord, save their souls. Lord, deliver them from these things. Break the blinders that the God of this world has put over their minds so that they can actually see that the light of that glorious gospel will come into their lives. Hey, and Lord, while I'm praying that for them, I think you need to put more light in me because I ain't been seeing so well myself. He remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Now, one thing about Lot being brought out, remember, Lot was defiled. The Bible says his soul was vexed by the things that he lived around. You're praying for people, and you know very well you see that vexation of the things that they live around affecting their lives, affecting their attitudes, affecting how they think what they're doing right now. If witchcraft is popular, they'll dabble in it. If everybody, you know, hanging out at the bar is popular, they'll dabble in it. Yet they'll still say they believe in Jesus, they love the Lord, they go to church and everything else. They're vexed by these things. When ethnicities rise up, with their ugly heads and you gotta be this and you gotta be that, they'll dabble in all of that. They're vexed, it says his soul was vexed. His mind, his will, and his emotions. Well, I wanna think like they think. Pay attention to this new world order, the God of this world and what he's cleaning out so that he can build and establish is what that dabbling is all about, what they're dabbling into. They love the idea of a global society, of a world passport, of a world money, of world regulations. They'll love that stuff because they're blinded. So, I even wrote down here, I hate to go back to this, but while they're cleaning up the world, you see the EPA declares that all these emissions and throwing your tires in the river or the ocean and starting your lawnmower too soon in the day is why we have problems. <laughs> so that means we'll be able to fix all the problems. Amen. But in reality, God back there in the garden the term because in, uh, I think it's uh, chapter 3 of Genesis. Because you have done this is why all this happens, God said. And to Adam, he said, because you listen to the voice of your wife. All this happens, God said. God didn't tell Adam, you have to wait till 7 o'clock at night to start your lawnmower. Because he didn't have anything to mow. Everything grew perfectly. Right? There were no weeds. Uh, you didn't have to fear the snake because it was harmless. So were the other animals as far as we know. But this new world society has got to tell you all these problems. And part of that means, see, they want to reduce the population. 
Because man's the problem? No, man's created in the image of God. The Bible says in the beginning with Adam, and then when God recreated the earth through what he did with the flood and Noah, in both of those, he said, go populate the earth. Because that's what God wanted. Now, would God, who has all wisdom and knowledge, and who created the heavens and the earth, tell us to do things when there's no provision for everybody that's going to be there? No. If he tells you to go and start something, he'll provide for it. Because that's what he does. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53 says... Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means die, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen? Amen? Then the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we are to comfort one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Anybody believe that? Amen. We believe that he died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that means it's gospel, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, dead. For the Lord himself shall de descend from heaven with a shout, right? Same as it said there in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the dead will be raised. For the, did I say it wrong? Oh, for the, the Lord shall, himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Now, you all imagine that together means the dead who were just raised and us who are raised, right? Amen. Together with them in the clouds. So together, and sometimes the clouds represent clouds of people, masses of people, just like when it talks about the seas many times in Revelation, it means the seas of people in the earth to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Amen? Amen. Remember what I said earlier, I gave you this sheet. Uh, I don't know if anybody could pick that up from looking at it on here, but this is actually out of Rose Publishing's, um, I forget the name of the book now, it says here you can reproduce it for teaching and so on. Anyway, if something is described to you about somebody went to heaven uh, and tells you all these things, and uh, like I told you, this guy who wrote the Passion version of the Bible says he went to heaven and God took him, Jesus took him in the library and he saw all the books on the shelf. Do you know, and you, I kind of, you all laughed when I said this, but he told the host of the TV show, you're not going to believe this. Uh, but I had a thought that I wanted to steal one more book. Now, if you go in scripture and read what is in heaven, it says very clearly there is none of that which tells me you're a false prophet. Amen. You're a deceiver. You're not going to have an evil thought when you're in heaven. Amen. Because your faith has come to an end, you are perfected now. Amen. 
You won't even be mindful, like I've said so many times, which I'll be honest with you, I never hear anybody saying this, that we're not going to be mindful of any of this anymore. You're not going to be thinking about how's your daughter. Your daughter, she's in the Lord, she's perfect. Amen. You're not going to have thoughts like that. I, I, pray that I, I pray that I'm not off on something myself. But if you just read the scripture, that's what it said. These things won't even come to re remembrance anymore. So everybody you were mad at, you better get over it now because you're going to forget about them. They're going to walk up to you in heaven and you're going to just, hopefully you make it heaven, they're going to hug you and love you and you're not going to remember you were mad at them for 35 years. Amen. They offended you in church. They didn't look at you right. Amen. The mosque, the synagogue, the church should tell you the times we're in. Amen. If this stuff doesn't scare you in the right way, in the right way, something wrong. You better seek the Lord about am I even alive in Christ Amen. Jesus? Have I been quickened? Amen. Well, Father, I thank you for the word this morning and and Lord, forgive me if in my dramatizations or any of that type of stuff it isn't good, I don't know. But Lord, I, I really want me and us to understand and get the point. And Father, be revived and be made alive. And Father, fear God more than we ever have before. And be ready for these times that are before us in the day of that shout, that trump, Lord God, when we're caught up to meet you in the air. Lord, I know we don't understand it all, so thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the love of Christ that is in us. And thank you that we have a lively hope. Just like you didn't leave Jesus in the grave, you're not going to leave us here. We thank you for that this morning. Pray for a lot of folks listening in, if they will. Pray that this causes them to really want to know you, want to seek Jesus not know us people or better or some famous preacher. I want Jesus. Amen. I want the Christ. I want the Messiah. I want saving grace. I want to be patterning my life after him, not some popular miracle worker Amen. or evangelist or any of these things. I want to be right with God. Father, I just pray all that for anybody listening, anybody here with us, Father, so many people we miss that haven't been in church. Lord, that you know where they are and what they're doing and what they've dismissed and what they've allowed. You said about us who condemn ourselves by the things we allow. God, I pray that they're not condemning themselves in the way of salvation. Father, I thank you this morning, give you all the praise and glory and honor. And again, thank you for this word and the life that's in this word and the stirring in every one of us this day and all these days to come and ask it all in Jesus' name. If there's anybody listening, if you're listening, I could tell you to pray the prayer and do this and do that, but the main thing is start seeking God. Start asking God to forgive you for your sins. Desire to get right with God and know the truth. Get around people that you know are walking with the Lord Jesus. They're obeying the commandments of God. They may look like the goody two-shoes to you. They may not be in the party scene. They may not be dabbling in all the things out there that other people you know said they're Christians, but they're doing it all just like you do. And some days you may say, well, they act just like me. Get away from them and get around people that do what the Bible says. You'll be blessed in the long run. Ask him to come into your life and be your Lord. That's what changed my life. That's what changed all these people. That's the night I was freed from drinking day in and day out. I accepted Christ, never touched it again. And I'm pretty adamant about it now because I'm watching people that are bound by it and can't get set free. Amen. The Lord loves us. That's why he gave us a savior. The Lord loved Lot. That's why he sent the angels. The Lord loved Noah. That's why he he prepared the ark, and he loves you and I the same Amen. and as much as he loved any of them. So God bless and thanks for being with us.